Hello, in this video we are going to be looking at the concept and nature of God from the first part of the Metaphysics of God unit. In particular, um, I'll be taking a look at the paradox of the stone, the Euthyphro dilemma, and God's supposed omniscience and the relationship between that and free will for human beings. I'll also be looking at some responses. So, uh, to get going immediately, first of all, how do we understand God in the Judeo-Christian tradition? Well, first of all, God is supposed to be omnipotent, that is all-powerful. And in the Bible, I've put two quotes here in Jeremiah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power, and there is nothing too hard for thee. And in Matthew 19, verse 26, with God, all things are possible. So as well as God's omnipotence, these quotes also imply God's omniscience, the idea that God is all-knowing. And God is also supposed to be all-loving or all-good. Some in the Judeo-Christian tradition also believe that God is present in everything, um, but not everyone believes that. Um, many believe that God is also immaterial and not physical, and that God is all infinite, always existing, having no beginning and no end. However, it is important to realise that not all religions believe that God has these attributes. In polytheistic religions, for example, such as Hinduism, no God has all of these attributes. Um, and some of the philosophical difficulties to which such an understanding of God gives rise, such as the problem of evil, are dissolved by these polytheistic religions. Um, so uh, because you don't have one God that is supposed to embody all of these things and you can explain the presence of evil in the world as a result. However, the AQA specification is concerned with the Abrahamic God and arguably a fairly con thin conception of it at that. Um, now this thin conception is sometimes known as the God of the philosophers, meaning that, that um, philosophy has tried to reduce God to three basic properties, omnipotence, omniscience and omnibenevolence, um, with the other optional properties thrown in uh, depending on the argument uh, being examined. So, these big three attributes that God is believed to possess are, it's also believed, synonymous with his perfection. So again, um, thinking in terms of the God of the philosophers, the idea of God's perfection is supposed to contain and be exemplified by God's um, all-powerful nature, um, his omniscience and his omnibenevolence. Um, but there are, of course, questions that relate to perfection. Um, what does perfection mean? And what issues does this raise for the possibility of God's existence in both empirical and logical terms? And that is perhaps not something we're going to be looking too much at here, uh, but it's certainly something that will be uh, of uh, importance when it comes to thinking about the problem of evil um, and arguments such as the ontological argument. However, um, it has some relevance, uh, certainly when it comes to the paradox of the standard Euthyphro dilemma. Does God exist inside or outside of time? All right. And what implications does this have for arguments that attempt to demonstrate his existence? And that is something um, that we'll be looking at in particular uh, in relation to uh, the Euthyphro dilemma and free will. So let's start now with the paradox of the stone. And in essence, um, the paradox of the stone is trying to undermine the idea that God is all powerful. All right? So it's generally put forward by people who either um, are making some sort of argument for atheism or at least arguing against the idea of the Judeo Christian God. All right. Um, so a paradox demonstrates. Um, that there are some things that are logically possible to accomplish, um, but which God cannot complete. So, for example, I have written this PowerPoint, thus I have written a PowerPoint that God has not written. It is therefore not possible for God to write a PowerPoint that God did not write, just as it's impossible for you to write an essay you did not write. So this is a logical difficulty that is taken further by the paradox of the stone. <clears throat> 
you and I can create objects that are too heavy for us to lift, right? So as far as I know, no human being is able to lift a tractor, although human beings invented tractors. But is it possible for God to be able to create something that he cannot lift? All right. So the paradox of the stone is, can God create a stone that he cannot lift? Being all powerful must mean that he is able to lift it. And this seems to directly contradict Jeremiah and Matthew. If all things are possible, then it must be the case that God can both make a stone that is too powerful, that is too heavy for him to lift, sorry, and lift the stone that he cannot lift. And that seems to make very little sense. But it's a contradiction, right? Um, on the one hand, if God is all powerful, then he must be able to create a stone that he cannot lift. But on the other hand, if he can't lift it, how is he all powerful? All right. So there must be something that God cannot do. Either he cannot make a stone that he cannot lift or he cannot lift the stone that he has made. So the paradox can be used to cast doubt on the idea of God as omnipotent and omniscient. Let's have a, a look at a few solutions to this paradox. Well, one answer is to suggest that by being omnipotent, by being all powerful, God is able to transcend the laws of logic. Right. So he can make a stone that is too heavy for him to lift and also lift it. Right. But this doesn't seem to make much sense. It's certainly not helpful. And it leaves us with an idea of God that is incoherent. You might as well say um, that God can be all powerful and not all powerful at the same time, all knowing and not all knowing at the same time, or all good and not all good at the same time. There is, however, another answer um, provided by George Mavarodos. He argues um, that we should begin by assuming God is omnipotent and then goes on to argue that a stone that is too heavy for God to lift is self-contradictory because it means a stone which cannot be lifted by him whose power is sufficient to lift anything. But a contradiction actually tells us nothing. It can't give us any new information. For example, consider it's raining and it's not raining on the same spot now. Right? Well, that it can't be true and it can't be false. Right? It's a paradox. It makes no sense. It doesn't. It's a contradiction. It cannot give us new information okay um, thus the paradox of the stone as it's a contradiction that tells us nothing about god's omnipotence or the lack of it okay so um, the argument essentially is that given that the paradox of the stone is a contradiction and doesn't tell us anything it therefore doesn't tell us anything about god's omnipotence or lack of omnipotence and therefore you know we should just not bother worrying about it too much However, Richard Swinburne, also a theist, provides um, an argument against Mavrodi's um, supposed solution. He points out that the paradox of the stone concerns an attempt to show the idea of omnipotence as incoherent. But omnipotence is not made coherent just because we assume its coherence at the start. Right? So Mavrodi assumed the idea of a being that is all-powerful is a coherent idea and Swinburne's pointing out that um, that's an assumption right why are we automatically assuming that the idea of an all-powerful being is coherent in the first place okay um, so the paradox of the stone is trying to show the idea of God as all-powerful as incoherent um, but omnipotence is not made coherent just because we assume it is coherent when we start our argument. So it may not be that the paradox of the stone is actually attacking anything at all. Here is a further solution. Uh, the statement, God cannot create a stone he cannot lift, has been considered to be logically equivalent to if God can create a stone, then God can lift it. But it's not absolutely certain, right, that the the two statements are equivalent. All right. So if you were going to kind of hold on to the idea, though, you might say that um, 
if God can create a stone, then God can lift it, does not entail that God is of limited power. Thus, God cannot create a stone that he cannot lift, does not entail that God is of limited power. Okay. However, there is a question, as I said, um, over whether these two statements are logically equivalent. If they're not logically equivalent, then it's not actually a solution at all. You know, if God can create a stone, then God can lift it. This still implies something God cannot do, i.e. God cannot confer upon a stone a property that defies subsequent lifting. So we still have a problem. Swinburne provides a different kind of solution. All right. Um, now, Swinburne's quite fond of, of providing sort of um, solutions to problems concerning God that use time. This is another one. Um, there is a temporal aspect, as I say in this. The thought is that God could create a stone that was impossible to lift. But if he did so, it would mean that he was no longer all-powerful. Provided that God has not created such a stone, he remains all-powerful. Thus, God could, in principle, discard his all-powerful nature, but that does not mean that he will. Again, having said that, is there any way we can establish whether or not God has created such a stone? And if we can't establish that, then it seems difficult to know whether God is omnipotent or not. Let's now move on to the Euthyphro Dilemma. Now, the Euthyphro Dilemma is so called uh, because it is first posed in a platonic dialogue of the same name, um, whose main character, Euthyphro, or whose main character is Euthyphro, other than Socrates, of course. Um, and Socrates asks Euthyphro, is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious, or is it pious because it is loved by the gods? In other words, does God do something because it's good, or is it good because God does it? On one side of this dilemma, is an action good because God commands it? It's, this suggests that morality is arbitrary. All right. In this case, whatever God commands is by definition good. If God commands rape, murder or FGM, then those things are good. All right? If an action is good because God does it. On the other side of things, if God does something because it's good, then that seems to suggest that goodness exists independently of God. All right? So God doesn't contain the entirety of perfection. There is something that exists outside of God, all right? Um, so God itself is not a ground for moral goodness, all right? So if we just go over that again, um, does God do something because it's good, or is it good because God does it? Now, if it's good because God does it, then anything that happens that is commanded by God is by definition good. On the other hand, if God does it because it is good, then that implies that the realm of morality somehow exists independently of God, which means that God is not entirely um, perfect, right? because morality somehow exists outside of God. All right, so we can't then say that God is all-knowing. However, there are some solutions to this. It does remain possible that God could have complete knowledge of independent moral standards, even if God actually isn't the creator of those moral standards. All right. Uh, but then, of course, that does still leave open the question of whether God is the creator of all things. But it does allow us to say that God can remain all knowing. Nevertheless, perhaps a more substantial doubt exists over God's supreme goodness. Right? So if God does not, in some sense, exemplify goodness, if morality is somehow outside of God, does that entail that he's not all good? So that seems to be, again, an attack on one of the three main characteristics that God is supposed to have. 
How can we establish whether or not there exists a realm of moral perfection that is either incorporated by God or exists independently of him? Again, that's something that seems impossible to do. All right. And of course, um, going back to the other horn of the dilemma, if something is good because God does it, then whatever that thing is, is by defin definition good, even if it is rape, FGM and so on. So let's now turn our attention to free will. Now, in the Garden of Eden, God is supposed to have given Adam and Eve free will. They can do anything they like in the garden except eat of the tree of knowledge. Now, because they have free will, um, Eve and Adam are tempted by the serpent and eat of the tree of knowledge and find themselves cast out of the Garden of Eden by God. All right. Now, if God is all-knowing, then he will know all of our future actions. Right? And if he does not know all of our future actions, he's not all-knowing. So presumably, he would have actually known, prior to Adam and Eve eating of the tree of knowledge, that they were going to do it. So this raises some significant questions about moral responsibility. If he knew that Adam and Eve were going to eat of the tree of knowledge then that firstly implies that although Adam and Eve might have thought they had free will, they didn't have genuine free will because God already knew how it was going to turn out. And if it was already known how, they, how it was going to turn out, how can you genuinely hold Adam and Eve responsible for their actions? All right. So that's one possible problem with the idea of God being all-knowing. So we can summarise that. Either God is not all-knowing, not omniscient, or we do not have free will. Moreover, if we do not have free will, then how, how is it possible to be held morally accountable for our actions? All right. And so it would seem to be a massive injustice that we must live by the teachings of the Bible on pain of punishment if it's inevitable that we're going to act um, in these ways anyway. OK, and of course, um, the idea um, of creating uh, a being at all uh, that is going to commit moral wrongs and knowing that that being is going to commit moral wrongs, one might argue is actually an immoral act. And through that idea, challenge the idea that God is all good. And of course, um, when it comes to the problem of evil, um, that's something uh, that you might want to do. But there are some possible responses uh, to this omniscience and free will problem. Some um, argue that God is timeless. God exists outside of time. All right. Um, and so he doesn't know anything in advance. All right. Because there is no time. OK. The very idea of foreknowing something, of knowing that Adam and Eve would eat of the apple, invokes the concept of time because it means he knows something before it happens. However, that leaves open a sort of incoherent idea. If God is timeless, what that means is that essentially all events just occur all over the place. So as I talk to you now, the Battle of Hastings is occurring alongside each of your birthdays in World War II. And that just seems to make absolutely no sense whatsoever. OK, so the timelessness response is problematic from that point of view. All right. In any event, we still seem to be forced to choose between God's omniscience and human freedom. So that's the end of this video. Um, do please read the literature that is attached to this lesson.